So in this video, we are going to talk about the ionic bonding model. And we teach you about ionic bonding all the way back in general chemistry. That it's based on the electrostatic forces of attraction between ions of opposite charge. That's the only thing that's holding an ionic lattice together. It's the force of attraction between the positive and negative charges. So I'm going to divide this up into four parts. What is lattice energy? What is it? How do we experimentally determine lattice energy? That's from a Born-Haber cycle. How do we theoretically determine lattice energy? In other words, based on Coulomb's law and force of attraction between ions, we can go in and derive in a theoretical value for lattice energy. And last is what sorts of things influence lattice energy. So first of all, what is lattice energy? It's the large release of energy that occurs when gaseous ions coalesce into a crystalline solid. So it's the energy change associated with one mole of your compound from one mole of gaseous ions. So one mole, for in the case of example of lithium fluoride, one mole of gaseous lithium ions combines with one mole of gaseous fluoride ions to form the lithium fluoride solid. So it's the, one more time, it's the, it's the enthalpy change associated with the formation of one mole of compound from the gaseous ions. So if we could measure the enthalpy change for this reaction, we could measure the lattice energy. But this is difficult to measure directly. What we can do is we can get at it indirectly using what's called a Born-Haber cycle. So what's a Born-Haber cycle? It's a series of steps and their associated enthalpy changes from elements to ionic compounds devised to calculate the lattice energy. It's really an application of Hess's law, which is something that we teach you in general chemistry. that says the enthalpy change of an overall process is expressed as the sum of the enthalpy changes of its individual steps, which is a fancy way of saying if we have some reaction, if we have a series of reactions, and that rea those series of reactions add to some overall reaction, that we can add the enthalpy changes together in the same way that we add the reactions together. In this way, that you can get at some reaction that you might not be able to measure directly, in this case, lattice energy. So, Let's use lithium fluoride as an example. Let's suppose you want to calculate the, let, the lattice energy of lithium fluoride. So here we have some reactions. And these reactions add up to some overall reaction. So let's go through these one by one and talk about each one of these steps. <coughs> so in the first step, we have the formation of gaseous lithium from solid lithium. In other words, this is the atomization or the vaporization of lithium from solid to gas. That's positive 161 kilojoules per mole. Now you might remember that a, that a positive enthalpy change indicates an endothermic reaction. So this is endothermic. This is energy that we have to put in basically to break apart the force of attraction between the lithium atoms and the solid state. In the next step, we're going to ionize the lithium in the next reaction. So we go from lithium gas to lithium plus plus an electron. We're ripping out an electron. That's the definition of ionization. So this is the ionization energy, which is positive 520 kilojoules per mole. So here we have another endothermic 
step, a pretty large endothermic step. So, so next, we're going to work on the fluorine. So we have to break apart the fluorine because fluorine is a diatomic molecule, and we don't want a molecule, we want individual atoms, right? So we have to break that bond. That's the bond energy or the dissociation energy. Again, we have another, we're breaking, tearing something apart, we're breaking that bond, so we have another endothermic step. That's 79.5 kilojoules per mole. And then, um, almost last, the fluorine, gaseous fluorine atom picks up an electron and becomes a fluoride ion. That's the electron attachment enthalpy. That's minus 328 kilojoules per mole. Now we have one more step, and that's lithium plus gas. The lithium plus gas then combines with the F minus, with the fluoride minus, gaseous lithium plus ion combines with gaseous fluorine ion to form lithium fluoride. That's the lattice energy. That's the one step that we don't know here. That's what we're trying to figure out. But we know all these steps add up to this step. Now what's this last reaction? It's lithium solid plus fluorine gas forms lithium fluoride solid. Now that's not the lattice energy. This is the, it's just the heat of formation because we're forming from the elements. That's the definition of heat of formation for the one mole of, for the formation of one mole of compound from the elements and their standard state. And that's what we're doing here. So, this is not the lattice energy, this is the heat of formation. So, we know all these steps, in fact, I can show you, all these steps add up to this last step. Pretty much, well, not pretty much, everything cancels out except for this last, except for what we need for this reaction. So, everything else cancels. So, let's look at this. So your lithium gas cancels, and your fluorine gas cancels, and your, let's see, your fluoride cancels. So what are we left with? This we keep, right? That's this, okay? And the one-half fluorine we keep. Okay, that's this, and the lithium fluoride solid we keep. So everything else cancels out except for this reaction. So, in other words, all these steps add up to this reaction. So all we have to do then is basically subtract these numbers from this, and we'll have the lattice energy. So rather than add them up and subtract them, I simply subtracted them one at a time. So minus 617 minus negative 328 minus 79.5 minus 520 minus 161 comes out to be minus 1050 kilojoules per mole, which is a whopping big number. There's a lot of energy released when those when those gaseous ions come together to form that ionic compound, you're getting out all the energy and those electrostatic forces of attraction. And it's the lattice energy that makes the overall process exothermic. So we have, a, we have three endothermic steps up here. And yes, this adds up to a pretty exothermic step. So you know this reaction must be pretty exothermic. The lattice energy must be pretty exothermic. So that's how you basically do a Born-Haber cycle to get at the lattice energy. So what about theoretical lattice energies? How would we calculate a lattice energy? First of all, recall that potential energy decreases when objects that attract. And in this case, we're talking about ions of opposite charge. Potential energy decreases when objects that attract are brought together. So we have a, a positive and a negative ion 
as we bring them together, potential energy decreases. It would increase if we separate them, right? You would have to, they attract, so you'd have to put in, put in energy to pull them apart. But if you're bringing them together and then energy is released, we get energy out. So let's start with the simplest case. Let's just talk about an isolated pair of ions, a positive and a negative charge, isolated all by themselves then we can calculate the energy for that using this equation that equals e, e squared over 4 pi e naught r r naught. So what does each of these terms mean? E is, e is simply the charge on an electron, right? Positive and negative ions are formed by the loss and gain of electrons. So even though we're talking about ions, the charge on the ion is going to be some multiple of the charge of an electron. Okay, so E is the charge of an electron. Epsilon naught. Now, that's the dielectric constant of a vacuum. Okay, uh, 8.54 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per meter per joule. And R naught is basically the is the distance between the ions, which is the sum of the radii, which is the sum of the ionic radii. And look what happens to our units here. You're going to have coulombs on the top. Those coulombs will cancel the coulombs here. And if we measure the distance between the ions in meters. This is meters to the minus one power, so the meters will cancel the meters in R naught. If we measure R naught in meters, that's going to leave only joules. So this is ultimately going to give us units of joules. So this is just an isolated pair of ions. How would we adapt this and modify this equation for a lattice, right? Because in a lattice, you have ions that's three-dimensional. You have ions going in three dimensions. Furthermore, in the lattice, it's, it's not just attractive, repulse, attractive forces. There's repulsive forces taking place as well. So we have to take into account the repulsive forces as well as the attractive forces. So this is the Born land equation, which looks somewhat similar. You can recognize a similarity, but a few more terms have been added. The first three are the same. E, one more time, is the charge on an electron. 1.602 times 10 to the minus 29, I'm sorry, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. E naught, dielectric constant of a vacuum. And R naught is the distance between the ions, which is the sum of the radii. What we've added is n, right, which is Avogadro's num number. We typically express things in units of uh, per mole, not per ion. m is a matter alone constant. I'll have to talk about what that means. Z is simply the charge on the ions. If you're dealing with a, with a plus 1 and a minus 1, you can leave that out. If it's a plus 2 and a minus 2, you'll have to use a 2 there. Okay, and then N is the born exponent. I'll talk about what that means. So first of all, let's talk about this Madeline constant. What does that mean? All right. So the Madeline constant sums up the Madeline constant sums up the attractive and repulsive forces between the ions in a crystal or in an ionic, ionic compound. So let's use what is perhaps, as an example, what is perhaps the simplest structure, which is halite. Okay. So obviously it's not an isolated pair of ions, right? So each ion is are not away from six ions of opposite charge, right? That comes just straight out of the coordination number, right? In the previous videos, we talked about coordination number, and you know that in halite, each ion is surrounded by six of the other type. So here's a halite model, right? So let's look at the one in the middle here. 
it's surrounded by six of the other type. So it would be surrounded by this one back here, this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one here, right? One to the back, one to the front, one to the right, one to the left, one to the top, one to the bottom. Each ion is surrounded by six ions of the opposite charge. But, like I said, there's repulsive forces taking place here as well as attractive forces, right? So it's R0 square root of 2 away from 12 ions of like charge. So one half is the same thing as square root. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about, we're talking about going from here to here. We're talking about force between an atom here and an, an, an ion here. Ion here, ion here. Now this is R0. Here is R0. That's the distance between our radius. It's a cube, right? So this is R0, and that's R0. So that's ju this is just an application of the Pythagorean theorem. We can say the same thing. So this is R. This is R squared root of 2, right? So you're surrounded by 12 of like charge. Let's see if we can let's see if we can find these, right? So let's look at this one in the middle. So what can we find 12 of like charge, right? So we'd have one here, right? From one here, one here, one here, one here. That's four. Then we have another one up here, right? Going from going from going from here to here. We're going through another diagonal. Right, so it'd be this one, this one, this one, and this one. That's four. And then four more along the bottom. So this one, this one, this one, and that one back there. Right? So you've got you got twelve total. You got twelve total. So you so you are R naught square root of two away from twelve ions of like charge. Now where R naught square root of three, one third is the same thing as square root of three. Raised to the one third power is the same as square root of three. We're away from eight ions of opposite charge. So we're back to opposite charges again. So can we find these in here? So square root of three, it sounds like we're going through a cube diagonal, right? Because we talked about the body-centered cube, atoms touch along the cube diagonal, which is uh, square root of three, right? So we're going through we're going through a cube diagonal here. So for example, we'd be going from let's say this atom to this atom, from from this one to this one. If this distance is r, then this distance would be r square root of three, right? So we had so we're going to have eight of eight of those eight ions of opposite charge. So that would be, so for example, if we go back, if we look at the center one here, so that would be from here to from here, so it would be these four, or these eight rather, one from the center, from the center one to here, to here, to here, to here, and then the same four, the same four on the bottom. Okay, so so R not square root of three away from eight ions of opposite charge, and then again so two R away from six ions of like charge. So now we're talking about the distance between let's say here and here, right? So this 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 would be. Because these are like charged, this would be a repulsive force. So this distance is 2r. So what we have <clears throat> is an infinite series of alternating positive and negative numbers, right? We went from opposite to like to opposite to like, right? So we're going from plus to negative to plus to negative, back and forth, an infinite series of alternating positive and negative numbers. So that's what the Madelung constant is. It sums up all the attractive and the repulsive forces between the ions in the crystal, in the compound. So 
each structure has a unique Madelung constant. So, for example, cesium chloride, 1.763, halide, 1. Point, halite, excuse me, 1.748, fluorite, 2.51, myelin, spirite, 1.683, and quartzite, 1.641. Now, note that the Madelung constant depends only on the structure. It does not depend on the radius of the ions, nor does it depend on the charges in the ions. Remember that each one of these was a prototype structure. So, for example, there's several other compounds that adopt the halite structure. They may not be salt. They're not salt. They're another compound, but they adopt the same structure, and they're said to would said to adopt the halite structure. Some of those, the radii are going to be different. Some of them, the charges on the ions may be different, right? So this depends, it's unique to the structure. It has nothing to do with the radii and it has nothing to do with the charges on the ions. The Madelung constant is unique to the structure. Now, we have one more thing in our Born equation. So, so, we, so now we know what the Madelung constant is. We said Z was the charges on the ions. So what is this last term over here? This 1 minus 1 over N. That's the Born exponent. And, and this accounts for the repulsive forces between the nuclei. So basically, we're grouping these ions here. E each one has each one has a, a specific Born exponent. We're grouping the ions according to the number of electrons. So, for example, helium, a helium, and a lithium plus <clears throat> have the same number of electrons. A neon and a sodium plus one, and a magnesium plus two, and an oxide, and a fluoride, those all have the same number of electrons. They're isoelectronic. We would use a seven for those. For argon, potassium, calcium, sulfide, chloride, those are all isoelectronic. Same number of electrons. We would use a nine. Krypton, rubidium, strontium, we use 10. Okay. So for an ionic structure, n will be the average of the two numbers. So, so for example, we wanted we wanted to know what boron exponent to use for um, sodium chloride. Then it would be we would find sodium, it's seven, chloride is 9, we take the average of 7 and 9, which is 8. Or if we were doing lithium fluoride, it would be 5 and 7, we take the average of 5 and 7, that would be 6. Okay, or if we were just doing, let's say, sodium fluoride, then we wouldn't have to do an average, it would be 7. Alright, so as an example, let's calculate Let's use the Born-Land equation. Let's calculate the lattice energy of sodium chloride. So to do this, we would have to know the, radi the radius of a sodium ion, that's 102 picometers, and the radius of a chloride, that's 181 picometers. So r naught, that's the distance between the ions. That's simply the sum of the radii 102 plus 181, that adds to 283. Now, what's P? P, this means P. P is pico, that's picometers, that's 10 to the minus 12. So this is 283 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, or write it in standard scientific notation, 2.83 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. To be consistent with our units, we had to convert this into meters because of um, because uh, this constant is in units of coulomb squared per meter per joule. So the distance has to be in meters. 
And we need to know the Madeleine constant for the halite structure, which is 1.748. All right, so we're going to take Avogadro's number. So this comes out to be per mol. Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, times the square of the charge on an electron, right? Because this comes from the product, related to the product of the charges, so we square it. 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 times the Madelon constant times the Born exponent, which we figured out is 8, so 1 minus 1 over 8 divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times r naught, which we said is 2.83 times 10 to the minus 10th. And this comes out to be 750, 471 joules divided by 1,000 to convert it into kilojoules. 750 kilojoules, or really kilojoules per mole, since we're doing it for a mole, okay, 750 kilojoules. And that's how you calculate and that's how you can calculate theoretical lattice energies. So last, what are some things, let's talk about this qualitatively. What are some factors that influence the lattice energy? Well, lattice energy <coughs> is directly related to the product of the charges on the ions. Okay, it's equal to the product on the charges in the ion. So, for example, if we compared lattice energy of lithium fluoride and magnesium oxide, both of these adopt the same structure. And furthermore, they're of comparable radius. Lithium plus and magnesium two plus are of comparable radius, and fluoride and oxide are of comparable radius I mean, they're not exactly the same, but they're in the same ballpark so that we can attribute the change in the lattice energy to the charges on the ions and not to the radii. Well, the lattice energy of lithium fluoride is minus 1050 kilojoules per mole, and the lattice energy of magnesium oxide is minus 3791 kilojoules per mole. That's a pretty big increase. In fact, it's almost four times as much, right? Because if we go back and look at the this equation, the lattice energy is related to the product of the charges on the ions. So that if we double the charges on the ions, we quadruple at the least if everything else were to stay the same, let's put it this way, if everything else stayed the same and the radii were exactly the same and we doubled the charges on the ions from plus 1 and minus 1 to plus 2 and minus 2, then the lattice energy would go up by a factor of 4, right? So the lattice energy is proportional to the square of the charges on the ions. So that's directly related. As, as, the, as, the, as the charge goes up, the lattice energy goes up. And in fact, it's related to the square. Or the, basically, it's related to the product. One more time, it's related to the product of the charges. So if we double the charges, we'll <coughs> quadruple the lattice energy. So last thing here is that lattice energy is inversely related to the distance between the ions. So for example, if we look at four compounds, lithium fluoride, lithium chloride, lithium bromide, and lithium iodide, we're keeping the cation the same, but we're changing the anion. It's going from fluoride to chloride to bromide to iodide. The anion is becoming larger. And what happens to the lattice energy? It goes from negative 1050 to negative 864 to negative 820 to negative 764. So the lattice energy is going down. 
or it's not as big, right? Because the ions are getting bigger. See, this is an inverse relationship. When you say something is inversely related, that means as one number gets bigger, the other gets smaller. And the gorin landy equation, we're dividing by r naught which is the distance between the ions, which is the sum of the radii. So as the radii get bigger, we're dividing by a bigger number, so, so this energy goes down. The separation between the ions is increasing as they get bigger. So we're seeing a, we're seeing a increase, or rather a decrease in lattice energy. So it's inversely related to the distance between the ions. As the radius of the ions increases, the lattice energy goes down. And that pretty much covers lattice energy.